Before we get started with this project, we need a little backstory. I built my first Atari 2600 portable back in the spring of 2000, but I didn't document the process and post it to the internet until that fall. I had a cheesy little GeoCity site, and the only reason it got discovered was because I mentioned my project on ClassicGaming.com. I was very surprised at how popular my project was, so I started coming up with new, much more aggressive designs. The problem was many of them were too aggressive, especially considering my lack of knowledge. So I started a lot of Atari projects that didn't end up working. It wasn't until mid-2001 that I had reliable designs I could easily build and sell. Along this path of destruction, I was buying a lot of Atari 2600 consoles from vintage game stores, eBay, garage sales, etc. I came across an Atari 2600 Junior in early 2001, the first one that I ever came across, and I bought it. By some sheer amazing stroke of luck, this was a very rare variant of the Junior, which has all three of the integrated circuits combined into a single chip, the one-chip Atari, codenamed Janus. I have never come across another one for sale even after 20 years of modding and hacking. I then proceeded to desolder this chip and try to make it into a super small portable. Alas, I did not know enough about electronics to make it work. I tried designing custom PCBs and eventually CNC milled a copper clad board. The tolerances were awful. I soldered the chip in, but of course it didn't work. I was worried I might have fried it. Again, I was just a noob and this was long before I had an oscilloscope. I gave up on the project in 2002. The test PCB sat in junk boxes for almost 17 years. It survived multiple moves, and I came across it again in the fall of 2018 as I was moving out of the Ben Heck Show shop. Armed with almost two more decades of knowledge, I decided to give it another go, to at least see if the chip still worked or not. The motherboard this came from is long gone, but my friend Parker Dillman, aka the Longhorn Engineer, actually has a single chip Atari 2600 Junior as well, so we can cross-reference the pinouts. This was my attempt at making a custom circuit board for the rare single chip Atari 2600 Junior console. Uh, I didn't really know what I was doing back then. I uh, routed this out on a CNC machine. I don't even see a oscillator on this. So yeah, I think what I'm going to do is actually uh, free this chip from its PCB prison and remove it and see if I can get it to fire up on its own. And the schematics look pretty simple actually. Basically stick in an oscillator, attach the cartridge, and then video and audio comes out. Got the chip removed. Now time to clean up the pins. That feels like I'm restoring a painting or something. This is the only one chip Atari 2600 I ever found, and believe me, I've looked. <laughs> you can usually tell by looking underneath the unit through the holes at the uh, solder mask. Hopefully I didn't destroy it. The circuit board that I made only had solder on one side, which means it was pretty easy to remove there are no plated through hole vias. So, how do we fire this puppy back up? Well, first of all, we're going to need an oscillator circuit to give it the 3.579575 frequency it needs to run. So that's the NTSC color burst frequency. But since this is an all-in-one chip, it basically just takes the one frequency because the CPU and the TAA are both inside of it. All right. I'll uh, wire up the oscillator, make sure that works first. Okay, so that's a crystal, which is different from an oscillator, because a crystal by itself isn't going to do anything. But if you hook it up to a NOT gate and a resistor and some capacitors, you can make an oscillator! Let's switch it on! Hey, there we go. Now I'm going to wire up this chip pin by pin. All right, got all the wiring on it. Kind of looks like a fuzzy caterpillar or a Medusa head. So I'm gonna connect this to the old cartridge slot and uh, we'll see if we can get a sign of life. Okay, we have the cartridge hooked up to the Atari One chip oscillator circuit and let's see what we can get. Okay, uh, we're not attenuating the signal correctly, but hey, it's alive! We thought it was dead. It's not dead. Keep an eye on channel two. That's going to be the Frogger music. Dun 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 dun
I disconnected the color burst just to see if I can get a black and white signal first. This is kind of cool. If you look on the scope, you can see the cars and things moving around in the video signal. Okay, I added a variable resistor to the color burst line and now, boom, we get signal. The logs are a little dark. So yeah, I'm not so sure about that. Of course, the resistor ladder is inside of the chip, so I can't really change the individual luminosity values. But uh, yeah, I've got a stable picture. This chip is not dead. Now that I know this chip works, I can start to design a circuit board for it. So for starters, I created a part for this chip in Eagle. And I have all, all the pins labeled and a physical representation of it that I had to draw from scratch because it's a non-standard uh, size. Well, I mean, it is somewhat standard, but it's not, you know, like a 0.1 inch pitch. What I did here was I started to draw kind of like a basic shape of a portable unit, of course. Got basically your standard 3.5 inch Amazon special uh, LCD backup camera screen. And this gray thing here represents the cartridge. And what I want to have here is a PCB that holds the single chip. Uh, so it will have a spot for the cartridge connector. And then these will be the tines that actually push open the door on the cartridge. If you look at it from a side view, the tines are centered with the uh, cartridge connector. So we might as well use a PCB for that. It just simplifies construction a little bit. One thing that I want to do that's actually going to complicate things, but I really want to do it is I want to have a window in the back of this unit so you can see that it does in fact use the very rare single chip Atari. Schematic view, we have our chip and more importantly, the board. So I've translated this from the measurements in Adobe Illustrator. And yeah, uh, what I need to do is I need to make a part for the card edge connector. I mean, there probably exists one online, but it's, it's probably faster just to make it. So I should have enough room here to kind of go into vias and crisscross off uh, into the uh, rest of the board. It's also why, you know, have as much space here as possible. I can't go all the way to the edge of the cartridge because obviously the cartridge has walls, but I got pretty close and this will give me a path through here for my traces. And one thing that's nice about this, um, you know, the chip is quite large, um, but we'll have a lot of room to run uh, vias and traces underneath it. And the external components, it shouldn't be too insane. We just have some resistors, a couple of transistors for the video, and then the uh, NTSC Color Burst Oscillator Crystal. And I'm going to actually use just an oscillator package, a little surface mount jobby. Um, there'll probably be two separate circuit boards. There'll be one in the front half of the unit here that will have the controls and probably the battery charger. And then that will connect to the rear circuit board, either through a ribbon cable or a header disconnect. I've created a part for the card edge connector. I've placed it onto the circuit board and I've started to run the traces. This is the schematic from the Atari 2600 one chip. Janus, as I've mentioned before, it's not entirely accurate, but it's pretty close. So I've gotten most of it redrawn over here in my schematic form. It's actually obviously a lot simpler than a normal Atari 2600 because you basically have a cartridge connected to one chip and that's about it. Let's go one layer at a time. Let's start with the top layer. All right, so we have the uh, single chip right here and we have a header on either side. Those are going to connect this to the top half of the unit, which will have the controls and the audio amplifier. And I have some uh, dip switches here. That will be for the left and right difficulty. Those will stick out the back of the unit. Well, they'll be flush, but uh, they'll be in the back of the unit. Here's the cartridge connector and the surface mount landing pads for it. We've got some inline resistors here for the two triggers. I did port out both of the joysticks to the other side of the unit because it might be possible to actually have a second joystick port. That'd be kind of cool. Let's look at the bottom layer. So I have a uh, NTSC color burst oscillator here. Pretty simple, you just give it power, put it into the uh, clock line and boom, you're good to go. We have our power going to the cartridge right here. We had to do a little bit of snaking to get that to fit. And uh, try to keep most of the circuitry on the back because obviously, you know, the chip, it's a, it takes up a lot of space, but obviously you can't put anything underneath the chip itself, but you can put stuff on the back side of the unit under the chip. So you have our video circuit here, a couple of transistors and some uh, pull up and pull down resistors. 
We've got our uh, pull-up resistor for the audio. Got our reset uh, circuit, which is basically just keeping reset high since it's a uh, active low signal. Then we're passing through um, video, select switch, start switch, color black and white. Then uh, the left paddle. So the only paddle that might be in this unit is like the player one paddle. Audio signal and then the triggers. So my plan is to uh, make sure this is you know, correct, then actually order a couple of these off of Osh Park. And then this by itself should power up just like the breadboard version. And if it does, then I can make another circuit board which matches headers and basically make the front half of the unit which will contain the controls, the screen, the battery charger, and all that sort of stuff. So this is just the rear half of the unit which is just the Atari itself. I made a printout of the rear side of the PCB and I made sure that I mirrored it horizontally so it would reflect how the PCB is actually laid out. So let's just put the parts in place. So there is the cartridge connector and then this is the oscillator. I made a custom part for it, an Eagle, so I want to make sure that my part is correct. And if you print something that's smaller than a page, it will print out actual size. This custom part fits. This custom part fits. Everything else is stock. Always good to make a paper print out of things. Paper is cheap. PCBs are expensive. Let's do some tests. First, I'm going to cut out these paper patterns. Doesn't have to be perfect. This is just for illustrative purposes. Using the laser cutter, I made this. It's a piece of engraving plastic. It's a sixteenth of an inch thick. The same as a PCB. Glue sticks. They're not just for kindergarten anymore. The rear. All right. Nice little representation of what our PCB is going to be. Atari cartridges are all a little different. The original cartridges from like 1977 up until about 83 had like this um, dust door on it. And the idea is there's tines on the console itself which open up the door and reveal the PCB. But then uh, when you get into the, the newer games like this Junior Pac-Man, they did away with all that rubbish and they just have uh, plastic tines inside of the cartridge that are used to open up the console side dust cover. The big difference is these tines don't move, so we have to make sure that our circuit board can clear them. Let's take our card edge connector. Oh yeah. See, that's a pretty good, good representation of what it's actually going to be. All right, let's try it with the old game first. No, oh, it's a Sears version. Space combat. These tines should open the door. Okay, they did. Okay, now we're gonna press in. Now when I pull this out, my PCB will come loose, and then we'll see that our cartridge connector is on the internal circuit board. And looks like, yes, it went in as far as it can go, which is good. Absolute newest 2600 game that I own, and actually one of the last 2600 games made, Xenophobe. Oh, I guess it's in place. All right. So just make sure these tines fit. Looks like they do. We're aiming to make this really small, <laughs> but I've always wanted to make one like this where it's just uh, the cartridge goes in the back and it's not very big. And speaking of which, that kind of begs the question, what kind of battery are we going to use? This one's probably too small. This one could work. Also, in this case, you know, we can't really put the battery down there. Of course, we can't put the battery down there anyway because the case isn't going to be that big. So probably have to put the battery kind of something like this. So we're going to have a sandwich where you're going to have the screen, controls, headers connecting both of them, battery in between, and then the cartridge and the actual Atari circuitry itself. Atari actually went out of business because they were sued by H.R. Giger, not Geiger. Now that I've mocked up the PCB and I know that it will physically work, it's time to get this thing finished. So I actually had the cartridge slot on backwards. Oops. <laughs> the idea is um, if this is facing out the back of the unit, then we want the uh, label of the cartridge to face out the back as well. So good thing I checked it. It was actually a little easier to wire once I flipped it around. 
everything looks pretty good. Actually, I just added a few extra surface mount resistor or capacitor pads just in case you need to mod something. I also added a couple uh, SOIC 14 packages in case you need to add like a logic gate or an inverter or something. Just in case, just in case, which means I probably won't need it. So over on uh, good old Osh Park, this is what it's gonna look like. Power without the price. Board outline looks correct. Got the holes there for mounting it. Let's get this puppy ordered and then we can continue the project. Oh boy, the PCBs arrived from Osh Park. Big shout out to Drew from Osh Park who got me the hookup, got these shipped a little quicker for me. Thank you, Drew. If you don't know what Osh Park is, it's a quick turn US based PCB manufacturing service. It's uh, pretty cheap and whenever you order something you get three of them. That's because when they make these PCBs, they just do a batch of three and they put all the panels, they stack them up like this. So when they drill the holes, they're drilling all three panels at once to save time. So that's why it comes in quantities of three. Let's see if this fits. Nice. Now I can start stuffing components. I'm going to start low level physically with the resistors. You want stuff to be low so it doesn't get in the way of the larger stuff that you're adding. I'm just gonna add a little bit of solder to one of the pads on the right since I'm right-handed. Then I'm gonna heat that up, bring in the resistor, then hit the other side. The reason I do this is so it's already secure on one side before I try to do the other side because if you don't, sometimes it'll stand up on end which is called tombstoning. I'm also gonna work my way from the top down Right? So if I'm doing something here, I'm not accidentally messing up something here, so I'm just gonna work my way down. I'm still waiting on some of the parts that I need, but I could install this oscillator. I could hit this with the heat gun or my reflow oven, but I'm not gonna bother. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ball those pads like that. Then I'm going to suck up the excess, which will leave a tinned pad. And now a little bit of flux. The bigger the glob, the better the job. One thing you gotta be careful with packages like this is not letting the solder hit the metal can because it will stick to it. Adding on the filter caps for power. I am waiting on a few parts still, but I have a lot of these in stock, a lot of these resistors. Probably because I have whole walls of components. Insert component wall shot here. Okay, I'm going to test to see if the oscillator is, you know, oscillating. Okay, it is oscillating correctly. I just want to make sure I check those sort of things now. So if there's a problem later on, I know that the oscillation wasn't the issue. The pads go further than the pins themselves. And the reason I did that was because I wanted to make sure that solder not only went into these eyelets, but also captured on the outside as well. So I mostly did that for mechanical purposes. So I'm gonna make sure this is nice and straight, then I'll solder it in place. Well, here's where the rubber hits the road. This test rig, I need to take it apart and transplant the super rare chip over into this. When they dig this up in a million years, they'll know who was responsible. I have to be careful here, these pins have had almost 20 years of neglect and rough handling. So while my whole pattern may be correct, <laughs> the pins are nowhere near straight anymore. So I gotta be careful I put them in correctly. Oh, good goodness, man. That took a lot longer than I thought it would. It was kind of like picking a lock, really. I was having to press on the chip and then seeing which pins had tension on them still. And then I knew which ones weren't lined up. With any luck, this will be the one chip's final home. Oh no, I soldered Noel it up and it didn't work. Crap. Well, I found the mistake. Originally I had A10 and A11 reversed, but then I realized on the one chip, all of the address lines are continuous. But then for some reason in my mind, because the cartridge is backwards, I drew this eagle part with these swapped around. So that's the problem. I swapped A10 and A11 without realizing it. I'm so used to those being swapped, I couldn't accept the fact that they weren't swapped. Anyway, I found some blue wire. So I was able to make a nice camouflaged 
Baj. You can barely see it. See, once you're moving your head around and stuff, you can, you won't even notice. I couldn't hear anything. Okay, let's see if it works now. Nice, Frogger, back from the dead. Well, I guess the next thing to do is work on a casing for the back of the unit. Doing a test print of the rear casing. Yes, it's a uh, pink filament. But it's pink filament that Joseph Prusa gave me personally. Look how well it's wound up on the spool. Kind of looks like one of those like peppermint lozenges, doesn't it? Let's do a test here. XY fits pretty good. Cartridge slot is a little tight. This is what it would kind of look like from the back. So there's going to be like a plastic window here to show the chip. that. That's what it'll look like in the back of the units. Very, very compact. Time to cheat and cut out paper patterns with a laser! Hmm, it's a bit flamey. Got this little air compressor here. Got this little air compressor here. Uh, basically, you can use it to blow air on the target and reduce flare-ups. Well, while that next test piece is printing, we can work on the foam core tests. So this is, uh, you know, foam core. Uh, each piece is 3 16ths of an inch thick. Therefore, if I stack up three of them, that will approximate the thickness of the front half of this unit. So what we can do is we can glue this together and get a decent idea of how it's going to feel in the hand. And then we can figure out where to put the buttons. I had the laser draw some slits here. That represents, that's all the more higher the internal PCB can go before it would hit the LCD screen. That's it. So let's put in a game. Yeah, that feels pretty good. So what I tend to do is I put the action button on the right thumb and the D-pad on the left. Mark it off, see what feels good on paper. Then, you know, do some more design tests and then eventually use this as the guide to design the PCB. It's way smaller. Thinner too, even with a cartridge in the back of it. Join the Clicky Screwdriver Fan Club today. Oh yeah, that's nice and solid. And the chip is protected with this super strong acrylic, but people can still see it. And then this decent amount of concavity here we could actually use that to our advantage. We could put in like a joystick port or even like a full-size paddle controller. See, if I put that there, then it's not gonna take up too much space in the front half of the unit and we'll actually be able to accommodate the depth of it. So I'll have a, a full-size DB9 second player joystick port. So that'll probably cut into this a little bit as well. Now that I know this thing is going to work, I can start concentrating on the aesthetic design. So I'm starting in Adobe Illustrator so I can do vectors and colors very quickly and then I'll translate it into 3D printed parts. What I thought I might talk about is kind of my design philosophy in general. I try to do um, a lot of dynamic symmetry and of course also use the golden ratio. So I wanna have a player two joystick port on the bottom of the unit. Again, we actually have enough room for this, <laughs> which is pretty cool. So I just desoldered an original joystick port off of an Atari. So here's how it would sit and see how it's going to bisect the middle wooden layer and the bottom layer and the top layer. So it's going to actually bisect three layers of casing. So I want to design something that'll actually kind of like look cool. And I don't want to say take advantage of that, but maybe like hide it. That's a better word to use. Align this to the joystick. Zoom in. I do a lot of the work in uh, vector mode. Sometimes colors are kind of pointless. So what we've done here is we've made a square that is the same height as the uh, 
joystick port. Now, if we're going to think about you know how much to expand it, we want to look at the spacing around it. So right here at the top, you see we have uh, the distance between uh, this and the uh, top of the of the casing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually take that and then go half the distance, just like that. I'm just going to use that square as a shape guide and then boom, put that up there. Now we have really consistent spacing. This space, this space, this space, this space, and this space are all the same. Now what about the horizontal? I'm going to use the good old golden ratio. Okay, so it's got 3.7 inches wide. I'm going to divide that by the golden ratio, which is 1.618. That gives us 2.2 blah, blah, blah. All right, let's copy that. We want to make it from the center. So let's make this with that amount. Okay, so now the difference between the width of the case and this is a golden ratio. Uh, a really good example of this is the original iPod. Uh, the difference between the height of the unit and the screen was a golden ratio. Uh, in this case, though, we want to do an inverse of the golden ratio. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, what's left, like kind of like the outside of this subtraction, and use that instead. Because as it is, it's too wide. Empty space on the sides compared to this is one golden ratio. Well, we don't just want a square here. That would be pretty lame. So what we could do is we could take the shape of this trapezoid and use that. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, that's good, that's good. And you know what else is good about this? See how we have a straight angle here? That means when we slide the casing together, we can just put the back of the case straight in. Like, vroop! Because this, all of this, will actually be attached to the front half of the unit, right? So you'll actually put the middle wood layer and the back layer on around this piece. All right, well, I'll probably tweak this a little bit more, but that's you know a basic overview of how I make design decisions such as this. I think we need to find some classic design elements. Look, there it is. The original design files for the original Atari 2600 Portable. Oh look, that was an early idea for the wood grain around the screen. Look how tiny the screen is in comparison to the unit. Well, let's get some legacy text off of here. Atari 2600 VCS. <laughs> TFT Active Matrix Display. Can't remember what this font was called. It was, was that some sort of Atari 2600 font? I don't know. Okay, that's one element. Okay, the holes aren't knocked out, so I can fix that. There we go. That's combined for some reason. Uh, hmm, these things aren't quite level to each other. Oh, what a mistake I made all those years ago. And we'll put it down here in this little sliver of silver. Tongue twister. You know, looking at this now, <laughs> this is three different fonts. One font, two font, three fonts which is kind of a no-no. Well, three fonts is like the maximum, right? But I have uh, more fonts on this thing, like the uh, select and reset buttons. Uh, what I could probably do is rewrite 2600 using the same font as this. Actually, just grab that. This is, uh, what is this? Oh, it's just good old Arial. It kind of looks like that's what 2600 is written in. I'm just gonna take the font I'm already using on the machine and use it so we have a little bit more visual consistency. 2600 looks a little weird now. I'm gonna blow it up just a little bit. Maybe like separate them? That could work. Like I could put this one kind of over there and then put this one kind of over there. Yeah, I kind of like that. It gives it some separation. I've been experimenting with some different materials for printing. I bought this stuff. It's like shiny silk black. Did a test print and it's like way too shiny. I mean, I like how it's shiny, but it's more of a gray than a black. Then I tried some uh, Amazon Basics uh, Black PLA, which is my daily driver filament because I'm not a very fancy person. And it's pretty good, but as you can see, you get kind of a shine on the back of it. This was with a pretty much completely clean glass bed. 3D Hero filament that I bought on sale. 
months ago for this project. It was like black and wooden colors. And I kind of like how this one looks. We have a few airs on the back here. But if you notice, it's kind of a less shiny finish. That's because I put some uh, glue stick down on the surface of the printer. And I kind of have an idea. What if I purposefully made a glue pattern to kind of create a diffusion on the back? And then make a PVA glue mixture, which is just, you know, Elmer's glue. And then apply it with this roller. So there would be a texture to it. I wonder if that would work. Oh no, it's still lumpy. It's a never ending project. Do 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 do. All right, I've got the first couple test pieces after using this um, foam roller applied glue pattern. It worked out pretty well. The texture on the base of the piece is pretty consistent and also fairly generic. It's not like overly shiny, like if you print directly onto the glass. But one thing I struggled with was the filleted edges, where it's a, you know, a rounded curve. And the issue with that is you get a little bit of uh, error on these spots here where the curve is not consistent. So what I tried was doing a chamfered version where you basically have a 45 degree angle there and also here. And that gave a much better quality of print. The next thing we need is the front half PCB, which is going to have the player controls and the battery charger. I started by taking the design I worked on earlier, and then I mapped the XY positions where we will need surface mount tack switches. Over here on the left, we're going to have a volume rocker with two right angle tack switches, volume up and down. We have a charge port over here on the right, and then we have select and reset, and our paddle, along with the DB9 for player two, and of course the two headers that connect this to the main logic board. Here's what I came up with. So to reference this back to Adobe, I actually would take measurements from this lower left corner here and then translate that into uh, XY measurements from the origin of the board here. Over here on the right, we have a lithium ion battery uh, charge control circuit, and that's coupled with a voltage boost. Lithium ion battery is uh, you know, nominally 3.7 to 4.2 volts, so we need a boost to get that up to five to use it with our Atari. And then over here, we have a pretty bog standard LM386 audio amplifier. And instead of having a mechanical potentiometer, we have a digital potentiometer. Basically, you have an up and down button. If you pull one of those low, it will cause the digital wiper to go up and down. Then we have some headers up here. This is the audio video header going to the LCD. And then we have our uh, boost circuit enable line here, which is going to go to our power switch. Then we have a couple uh, LEDs here in the middle for charging status and done charging status. All right, so I'm gonna get this ordered and then uh, we'll see if it works. Hey, look, the new control PCBs arrived. Nice. Obviously I don't have a stencil for this. I'm gonna put a little bit in the middle where the ground pad is, which is used for heat dissipation. The nice thing about solder paste is that it will, uh, it will flow where it needs to go. It'll use the surface tension of the copper to align itself. Flip over, flip over, flip over, there you go. Okay, now we'll do the other one, which is the boost regulator. Find the pin one orientation. Now I can't see the pins, but I can see the silkscreen outline of the chip, so that is what I'm aiming for. Okay, now I'm gonna use my heat gun on it. One thing that can be a problem with the heat gun is it actually is applying air pressure as opposed to like an infrared reflow oven. So you have to be careful that you actually don't slide the parts around with the force of the air. Chip's moving around on me. Come on. Come on, you can do it. You can do it. Be good. Remember what E.T. said? Be good. Drew Barrymore didn't listen. Uh, oh, there it goes. It lined up. See that? How it moved? And your turn. Oh, 
Well, I think it's pretty good. Obviously, there's a few uh, bridges, but I can clean those up externally using my soldering iron. As long as there's no internal bridges, we should be all right. Now, I could have done all the surface mount parts with the heat gun, but those are much larger and easier to do by hand. So I'm just going to, you know, do those manually. All right, I have the components for the boost circuit installed. I've got the battery plugged in. Ground is here and five volts will be here, hopefully. Ah, 5.1 volts. No, it's fine. Okay, the boost circuit works. So now I'm going to test the charging circuit. I am using a USB mini because I do not like micro and USB-C. And you know who agrees with me? The band tool. Ever hear of them? That's what I thought. I'm obviously completely validated in my opinion now. Let's do a test. All right, so power is off. I'm gonna plug the battery in. Plug in the charger and hope nothing explodes. All right, our charge light is on. So I'll give this about uh, 15 minutes and see if there's a voltage change and then we'll know if the charger's working. Okay, it's been 13 minutes. The voltage is now 4.1 volts, so yeah, it's definitely uh, charging. So I'm going to start stuffing the other components, such as the audio amplifier and the uh, action buttons. If you look on the underside of the board here, there's a white line. And I tried to keep all of the tallest surface mount components below that line because the battery is going to sit right there against the circuit board. Always a good idea to work on things while it's charging up and powered, right? Of course. It's the only way to fly. Let's try this DB9 taken right from Atari itself. Oh yeah, it fits. Even right down to the two tabs. It's kind of cool that a rando DB9 library in Eagle has the same mounting points as a 40-year-old connector. All right, here's the paddle. I had to cut away a little bit of the joystick, but I anticipated that. Okay, so the threads aren't quite making it through. That's okay, I thought that might be an issue. So what I actually did was I just made sure there were no traces anywhere near that hole. I can just drill it out a little bigger manually. I can see the comments already. Oh, he's drilling holes in a circuit that's actually powered on. Ah! Oh, I can't stand it. Anytime a human has an operation, they're alive. You know what's the difference? Now it fits pretty good. I've got everything stuffed onto this board, including the potentiometer, which I've cut down and added a notch to. They should fit nicely with our actual driver board. There we go. That is it. All right, let's give this a try. Everything's uh, in one piece. Oh, I hear the Frogger music. And there's the screen. All right, let's try the push button volume control. Let's go up. Down. Left, right. So this is why I like Frogger. See, all four cardinal directions work. All right, fire button works. Okay, so for the player one paddle, the schematics kind of misled me. I should have gone with my gut. Um, the paddle trigger button is the right button on player one. And also the paddle input was backwards as well. So I had to add some few bodge wires to fix that, but not the end of the world. Okay, so yeah, the paddle is rotating counterclockwise, clockwise, that looks correct. We can also see that difficulty switches are working. See how I can change it so I can have small paddles. Come on, kill me. What are you waiting for? Twist the knife. See what is going inside in my mind as you kill me. Come on, do it. Okay. Got our uh, Janus viewing window in place. Then I figured we could put like a cool triangle here. All right, so you got the back of the unit here. The cartridge goes in place. So we have our logic board down here. And then this is our control board. So we have thicker components going into this concavity, as we talked about earlier. 
and then you line it up and this just came off the laser as your screen bezel yeah starting to take shape so it should snap in like so and that's why we wanted to make sure we had a curve here but with a straight edge on it so you could you know basically pull the back piece straight out from it and leave this attached to the front of the case. I did a couple of raster engraves to uh, give depth to the shiny black acrylic. It mostly worked, although I think I might hit it with another layer of clear, but before I do that, I'm going to color in the top and the select and reset. So using the superpower of I own a laser, I cut some uh, custom stencil masks. Well, it's not really a superpower of I own a laser, it's I saved up money and bought a laser. You know, it's, it's not like I got bitten by a radioactive laser or something. Now what I can do is use this orange acrylic paint, dab it in there, and then let it dry. You know, much like surface mount soldering, it's not about being super precisely accurate, it's about controlling the mess. That's probably more than we need, but whatever. I'm just gonna move it around and let it go into the cavities, and then I will mop up the excess. I got some Rust-Oleum Triple Thick. I'm using that to paint the front of the case, basically to cover up the styrations of the laser cutter. It's still a little tacky, like my wardrobe. You can see the ink looks nice under the gloss. Looks pretty sweet. I've also been hitting uh, these with clear as well. Doing a lot of test prints of the front half of the case, making sure that the PCB fits correctly, that the wood inlays fit correctly, and basically to make sure it's right, because that front panel that I just showed you, the glossy thing, that takes some time and effort to make, so I wanna make sure when I do glue it to one of these 3D printed pieces that it is correct. Okay, I've got my piece of quarter inch cherry here. I'm going to attach it to my CNC machine. And I no longer drill holes directly into my table like a barbarian. I'm now using these clamps, which I covered in a video earlier this year, basically refitting the entire CNC table. So I've got my other laptop here, which I use to set up the file, and then I send it over the network to this old laptop, which is actually running the machine. off the surface to give us the desired thickness we need for the case itself. Let's check the depth. It's looking pretty good. All right, I'm gonna continue and make a deeper channel for the cartridge. Important to note, this isn't three-dimensional CNC work. It's a bunch of two-dimensional objects that are being cut to various depths. Now I'm gonna cut out the perimeter. I've got my stick here. Just in case, I mean, there are tabs that should stay in place, but you know, just in case something starts to move around. See? 
All right, I got the wood all cleaned up and sanded and fitting with the other components. So now I'm going to clear it just like I did the front of the unit. The MakerBot, seven years and counting. It still works and uh, still pretty good print quality. Slow though. Paddle shaft, there's a hole in the side for a set screw. And this will go against the flat portion I sanded off of the shaft. All right, so we got that notch there. Put this in place. Oh yeah, okay. Well, I can feel it resisting, so that's good. Okay, I'm continuing to work on the details, preparing the D-pad and the buttons. Oh, isn't that pretty? So I'm doing a test fit with the PCB. Man, think about how compact this could be if you didn't need this big bulky cartridge in the back. But then, you know, if it didn't have a cartridge on a real Atari, you know, it wouldn't be special anymore. It would just be some, you know, generic Atari box. Did several prints of the D-pad to make sure that it had the least amount of wiggle possible. Play your paddle games like this. I think this might be the best looking portable I've ever made. So after 18 years, the only thing that stands between me and finishing this project is literally watching paint dry. Okay, I have all the parts printed. Now I'm working on the wooden middle portion. I did have a crack while I was drilling out this hole, but I'm gonna wood glue that together and patch it up with some putty. It should be okay. So I added about four coats of triple thick. So what would that be, 12 thick? And some of these portions now need to be sanded down. This wooden frame needs to fit around these two pieces. See how they're gonna be flush up to the edge. So what I'm doing is just uh, manually dremeling out some portions that'll be hidden from view. Got the nice stinky wood fill. Danger, extremely flammable. So the ruled chemicals, the worse it smells, the better it works. Here's the completed insides of the front of the unit. I've attached the LCD here. Then we have our power enable for the boost circuit going up to our power switch. We've got power and ground going to the screen. And then we have the video signal over here inside of a shielded cable. It's really easy to forget about the thickness of wires, but you should definitely keep it in mind when you're building things like this. You can run out of space real quick. I do see something I wish I would have done differently. I should have put the power jack for the battery a little bit more this way, so I had clearance for the battery, but I think it'll still fit. So really, final assembly is just uh, putting the last few pieces together. I'm gonna take my wooden plate, whatever you wanna call it. I mean, it's really just for decoration. Looks like everything fits around it pretty well. So obviously I'm gonna wanna use some black screws for the back of this. I had some, they weren't quite the right length, so I cut them down to size. For some reason, it reminds me of a vintage 1950s bowling alley accessory. As I mentioned, there was some bow to this cherry, but these two side screws should pull the bow flat. Hopefully. Actually, oh yeah, there you go, look at that, see? There you can see the bow. I was really worried I was going to assemble this without the battery inside, but I remembered. All right, now we just need to attach the logic board to the front of the unit here. There's some tines. I don't think I've ever said tines so much in one project before. There's some tines on these little lips here that will fit into these notches. The reason I did that was to, well, help keep it aligned and also make sure that these pieces of plastic here on the side couldn't flex too much. All right, then we just need to engage the headers and it should be fully assembled. All right, I'm gonna attach the last four screws. We should be good to go. All right, one last little turn. All right, she's all sealed up. It's done. After 19 years, the Atari 2600 Junior single chip portable is finally done. Well, that took long enough. Cause I'm a shadow boxer, baby. I wanna be ready for what you do. Hey there, I spent 18 years in a junk box. Oh yeah? Well, I spent 30 years buried in a dump. Ooh, we should get together. Uh, come on. Uh, uh, uh. Oh. Yay! <laughs> 
Here's a considerably less smelly game. Oh, I need to pick a game to play. What game should I play? Matches my floors. How about Ms. Pac-Man? What's the difference between Pac-Man and Mrs. Pac-Man, really? I'm like an 8-bit Zack Baggins here, going after all the ghosts. Battle Zone. Charge! That one didn't put up much of a fight. Defender 2. This is a really good port, so I shouldn't whine about it. Ha ha, ha ha, I'll be here all week, try the veal. Moon Patrol. Oh, it doesn't have the music? I'll take care of that. It's time to go berserk. I got all the robots. Wait, where did it even come in through? There wasn't a door down there. My feet are kind of, oh great, can't get Moon Patrol out of my head. Oh, how about some Missile Command? All right, take that missile. You know, really the only winning move is not to play. Hmm, how am I gonna sell people on this, uh, this Star Wars program? It's, it's very, very expensive. I know, I'll call it Star Wars. People like Star Wars. Now for a size comparison. Yup, it's quite a bit smaller and with a bigger screen. What about this guy? Well, there you go. A project I started way back in 2001. After 18 years, it's finally completed. Well, that took long enough, but I think it was worth the wait. Well, thanks for watching the video and let me know what you think of the project in the comments below.